Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. Hi, my name is Leopold Gray, and I am a minister of the gospel. I serve currently in Florida, my church, All Nations Church. I work with Christian International, I have his legacy. It's uh, a great joy to come to you to be able to present this wonderful take of things we've been able to do over the past three and a half weeks. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I heard a word from the Lord to go into the nations and to be able to raise up disciples in a new way. I felt strongly from the Lord to go and feed them the word of God and feed them uh, the bread of life and help them to break bread. And so uh, from Mark chapter 6, we see Jesus with the disciples and after teaching them for a period of time, he turns to his disciples and says, you give them something to eat. And supernaturally, God brings provision. And so the Lord put on my heart to go into places with the gospel and to be able to come alongside the local ministers and partners to be able to see an advancement through the preaching of the word, through training, through making societal contributions uh, to advance the work of God and the kingdom of God in that region. And so we began to pray about it with a team locally in Florida and we began to trust God and began to map out strategies and we began conversations uh, with strategic leaders about where we could go, how we could go, what we could do, different types of events from seminars, from conferences, from outreaches, ways by which we could have a greater impact in, in the next few months and how things will look like. And supernaturally, God began to shape the vision and things began to take shape. Uh, we reached out to multiple places. And so about a month ago in the month of uh, March, we began to finalize our plans. And by the end of April, I traveled uh, to uh, Accra, Ghana, via United, United Kingdom through London. And I came here and met the local team on the ground. Our local team is made up of a meter team. We had music people. We had a strategic uh, music guys and uh, great administrators on the ground. And so we got on the ground. God, uh, we made arrangements for our accommodation, a uh, vehicle for us to travel. We were able to visit three major regions uh, in Ghana, Greater Accra, Eastern Region, Volta Region, and Central Region. Uh, Greater Accra was our main place where uh, the main city is where we're able to do quite a number of things. And then we went two, three hours uh, in different directions, uh, coming alongside different partners. The unique thing about this trip is we were able to touch different aspects of the kingdom work. We were able to come across uh, Christian educators who are working on school projects and helping students get educated and get education. And so we're able to come alongside them, pray with their children, uh, provide a meal for them, help them with infrastructure work that's going on in these schools. Uh, the combined strength of these schools is about 300 people. And that's amazing because these are kids uh, right from as young as uh, two years old all the way to about 14, 15 years old. And then God opened doors for us to work locally with Bible schools. So in Florida, I do work with uh, Tallahassee Christian College and Training Center in Tallahassee. And then I work with Ordinary Prophetic People uh, Ministry, which is a Christian education based in Atlanta, where I am an instructor. And so we had uh, connections with uh, people in Africa. So for the Ordinary, ordinary People, they have about 20 Bible students all the way here in Africa. And the, the school here, which has been partnering with them, uh, I came here on their behalf to in, in, in investigate and look closely at the facilities they have and come in with uh, a better understanding with the local context of what they're going through and how we can improve and extend uh, the Bible College in there. That's Horeb Bible College. You will see videos about Horeb uh, Bible College. We visited the city campus, which is about uh, one and a half hours away from Accra. And then we visited the main campus, which was about two hours from uh, the main city, Accra. The beautiful thing about Horror Bible College is that they do have a chain of churches. They have a great Bible college 
with uh, residential facilities for these students. They have great Bible halls uh, for teaching these students. And uh, they have great programs to help these students get planted after they graduate. Also, they do have a prayer camp, which was amazing to see people come in and pray and wait on the Lord and have an encounter with Jesus. They have a great auditorium. They have strategic programs in there for people to hear God's word, for people to experience the healing and the power of Jesus. And finally, uh, something which was actually a, a bonus for us is that they actually have a place for the mentally disabled, uh, marginalized in society, people who have been troubled and um, based on what their family members and what they have experienced here, they decide to reach out to the church to partner them. And so Mount Horeb does have a camp for mentally disabled people where they provide family members, can bring in their uh, mentally challenged uh, individuals and they would have medical care, but they would also have people praying for them and feeding them and accessing them till they get restored and get re reintegrated back in society. This was definitely one of the great uh, places we were able to go to. We were also able to go to uh, Anakazo Bible School, which is of renown by Bishop Dacko Mills, and see how established Bible schools training thousands of people yearly with infrastructure and learn more about the concept, we learn a little more about his crusades, learn a little bit more about his ministry and his ties and what God's using him for with the first love churches. And then finally, we were able to go to Asaman Kesi in the Eastern region. We were able to talk with Pastor Obing and his team. They've got an acre of land and they are passionate. His church is about 100 people. We got the chance to preach in the church, interact with the leaders, speak with the pastor. There was in multiple meetings, in board meetings, and multiple strategic planning meetings. The church currently buses people to uh, its venue from uh, about 45 minutes away from the church to be able to have people come in because the local location of the church is in a remote location. And so that's how they have a challenge hoping to be able to get their own bus instead of just renting it to be able to get more people to the church but they have been able to acquire uh, an acre of land which is beautiful this is a, a church under ladder house glory center by apostle fifi or and so after acquiring the one acre of land they went ahead uh, to speak with the architect i got privileged to see some of the architectural drawings you're hoping to build a two or three three tier building on different parts of the facility it will have residential, it will have the classrooms, it will have the labs, and then it will have the main auditorium. And the vision of this is to be able to train people. Now, the interesting thing for a lot of people online who do not know Asaman Kesi is, Asaman Kesi is the home for Hallelujah. what Put your we hands have in the United Jesus. States, the Azusa Street Revival. Here so it is, uh, the home the for the people of video, God, which they experienced many know, years ago. Very long. Uh, they had and an encounter with the Lord where literally the fire of God came up on the building and was the best of the ongoing projects with the schools. We are building uh, classroom blocks for two uh, schools because they were having overcrowding issues. So we are putting up uh, a classroom block uh, in two parts of the city to support the students and getting them fresh desks, amen. And then we're also partnering with that local Bible school. We work, met with your architects and we're gonna build a Bible school for the glory of God. The last part of the video we did not share is I went to Ghana in the time of Pentecost and in Ghana they have their own location for their own Azusa Street Revival. And so I visited the place where the revival broke out which now has uh, about 2 million people worldwide who have been saved since the revival broke out. And as I was in that location and we were filming, a visible cloud of the Lord came over the building as the Lord saying that my glory yesterday is my glory today. I believe that the glory of God is coming in a greater dimension like we've never seen before. And so your heart needs to be in a proper place so you can receive what God is about to do. Amen. Later in the video, we have testimonies of miracles. One of the main things we saw everywhere we want, went was the son of righteousness rose up with healing in his wings. Many people were healed instantly. Back problem, deafness, blindness, all kinds of mighty, mighty miracles 
were, were wrought by the power of God and many people were saved. And finally, we got to raise and train people, train the volunteers who were serving in the local churches and equip them with materials so they can be more effective in winning their land for Jesus. And so to all nations, I say thank you for all the support, for all the prayer. We'll continue partner, partnering with them through social media, through Zoom, and also physically granting support to the various schools and Bible schools and the various saints who are on the other side of the world. Amen. The greatest challenge I met as I went to uh, the country were places with no power. Amazingly, this morning I was, I was at home and my power just went off from Talquin. And I was telling my wife, this is not new. I experienced this when I was on the road because several times we lost power and I would have to travel everywhere with a power bank to reserve to be able to charge my devices and spend many hours just sitting in cars just driving three four hours on dirt roads to get to these guys all because God loves them God doesn't love them more than he loves you and me and because he loves you today he's giving us a word that tomorrow by this time there will be an economic revival so we're going to talk about this this morning and I believe it's going to be a blessing to you. When we hear the word of the Lord that there is going to be an economic revival and God is going to touch our economy and begin to touch how we do trading and how we do finances in the nations of the world, most of the time, the first question we ask is, if God is going to do this, when is he going to do this? As I traveled, uh, I went through, um, first I was in, I think I went to Texas, and then I went to London, and then I went to Accra. Everywhere I went, my time had to change. If I was to ask people in Accra today, what time is it? Accra is four hours ahead of us. They will say it's 3 p.m. in Accra. But in the United States, we would say it's 11.30. Whose time is right? When you hear the word of God and you, say, you hear the word of God and you say, when will this come to pass? When will this word come to pass? It seems like there's a difference between the timing of God and our own timing. Sometimes we hear God says that a virgin shall conceive and birth a child. Isaiah is prophesying of a virgin conceiving and birthing a child. And he literally dies before a virgin conceives and births a child. As Christians, we must understand that as part of our journey in this kingdom, in the kingdom, things are different. So before you became born again, the Bible says that we were in the kingdom of darkness and when we became born again, we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. And so becoming born again means that we have moved from one system, a place of setting laws, setting values, setting structure, even into another one. So we were first under the kingdom of darkness, and now we're in the kingdom of light. What does this mean? In South Africa, they drive on the opposite side of the road. If I was to get into my car and begin to drive and say, this is how we drive in America, I will have a head-on collision. You must understand that now you're in a new kingdom. Being in a new kingdom means that you need to understand what kingdom time is. It's not when you say, well, I believe that today is my day of a miracle and you receive a miracle. It's not based on how you feel, but based on the timing of the kingdom that you are in. And so as saints, we belong to the kingdom of God, and God would send forth his word as the beginning point for him to bring transformation throughout the world. And so believers must come to the place where they understand this in detail, so concerning Jesus, the Bible says in Revelation that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. Please follow me. Before God made the heaven and earth, the Lamb of God had been slain. But for Jesus to appear right here on earth 
as was done in eternity, it took 4,000 years. If Jesus had to wait for the time of God or the timings of God, you'll have to wait. Growing up, I, I grew up as a young person in the microwave society where you just get things now. I want it, I get it now. But in the kingdom, it's not so. Jesus, the Son of God, of righteousness, though he had been slain before the foundation of the world, for 4,000 years he had to wait. Genesis 49, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, or a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. God decided that the rulership will not leave Judah or the Lord giver from between his feet until the appearing of one called Shiloh, who is even Christ. For each believer, we must understand that the times and seasons are in God's domain. Most believers are frustrated today with your Christian life. You read a Bible promise, you had a prophetic word, you felt was going to come tomorrow. And what happened was that the time of your expectation came to pass and you did not receive an answer that you were looking for. So most people are depressed and are sad because they feel that God has disappointed them. God has not disappointed you. It's just not the fullness of time. The Bible says to us that in the fullness of time, Christ did come to die for us. The believer must become... Can we do PowerPoint? I sent you my PowerPoint presentation, please. Thank you. So let's look at Galatians chapter 4, my first verse. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 3 to 5. Even in the fullness of time, Christ came to die for us. So the lamb has been slain, but till the time is up, he cannot appear on the earth. In the Lord teaching about the kingdom to his disciples, he begins to teach them how to pray the Lord's prayer. And he says to them that, pray that thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. How many want to go to heaven this morning? Are you sure? Some people are not raising their hands. You're, we're looking at you three times. One of the reasons why people want to go to heaven is because heaven is a place where we've heard that there is no sorrow. There is no pain. It's such a glorious place. The streets are made out of gold. So when you think about heaven, you think about a place where there's no resistance to the fulfillment of the word of God. We think about a place where we will not have to struggle anymore. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, yes, in heaven, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So in Psalm 119, it says that the word of God is settled in heaven. In heaven, God's word has been fulfilled. And so everything is in order. We see God's word fulfilled in heaven and heaven is kingdom time. And so he's speaking to his disciples and he says, guess what? We need to see here on earth as it is in heaven. It's like you're reading your Bible and you know that in heaven you'll never be sick. And you're like, oh my God, how can I see here on earth that I will not be sick? So we think of heaven and we think of a place where the word of God has been fulfilled. But many times we read our Bible and we struggle because we see a promise. You hear a prophetic word. You have hope in something, but it's not done on earth as it is in heaven. So the first thing for the believer is the believer must begin to understand that God in his kingdom has settled it all. When he said it is finished, it is finished, it is finished, it is finished. And in the kingdom, God's vision is to settle everything concerning the believer. Believers must live in anticipation, knowing that the God who controls our times and seasons 
is able to fulfill that which he's promised. If God is able to fulfill that which he's promised, then there must be a reason why a lot of us are not seeing what God has promised. I say it again. If God is able to fulfill and bring his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, but most of us are not seeing it, there must be a reason why we're not seeing God's kingdom come and his word come to pass in our life. And we need to start asking ourselves questions. It means coming to church will not be enough. It means giving a good offering will not be enough. The Bible puts it this way. He says the word was preached to you as well as unto them. Speaking to the Israelites, they had heard the gospel that they would go into a promised land. Flowing with milk and honey, but many of them could not benefit from it. Most of us have lines of promises we've read from the Bible and prophetic words, but the truth is very few have been done. So the Bible says this word was preached to them as well as unto us. The word, the word, the word of God is the one thing that brings complete transformation in the earth. But he says, this word was preached to them as well as unto us, but did not benefit them. Hearing the word of God is not enough for you to receive a fulfillment of that which God has promised you. That's why you can come to church Sunday after Sunday and still things are not changing. Because the word did come to them. We're not the first group of believers to hear the gospel preached. And we're not going to be the last. He says that the word was not mixed with something called faith. Beloved, unless we begin to build a strong culture of faith and mix faith with the words we hear, whether it's the prophetic word, whether it's a promise, whether it's you're reading your Bible, whether it's someone prophesying to you, if you do not mix that word with faith, it will not benefit you. So they did not come into the inheritance. Joshua and Caleb were able to enter the promised land because they mixed the word which came from the mouth of Moses with faith. My question to you is, when was the last time you mixed the word you heard with faith? We thought it was just like a magic formula. It's like a genie. We're making a wish. <laughs> but God said... God said he would do this for me. My God said he would supply all my needs. But we didn't recognize that there's a responsibility. There's a responsibility. There's a responsibility for all those who believe. They must mix the word with faith. And so the whole focus of my message is going to be on Hebrews. Let's go. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 to 13. I'm going to talk about this for the rest of the service. For the Christian to begin to inherit the kingdom of God, to inherit the power of God, to see a fulfillment for prophetic words, for promises, for everything that you believe for, the Bible makes it very clear that there are two ingredients we need to add to what we hear. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 11 to 13. He says, we want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hopes sure. Verse 12, be ye not lazy. <laughs> Verse 12, be ye not lazy. I say it again, be ye not lazy. There are too many Christians who are still bottle fed in the church today. They are so lazy, they will not exercise their faith. And they are wondering why the devil is taking them for a ride. He says, be ye not sluggish, be ye not lazy, but imitators of them who through faith and patience receive the promise. Things don't just happen. Christians, wake up. Things don't just happen. Too many of us are lazy sitting on our couches and declaring, my God shall supply all my needs. It's time to get a job. <laughs> Too many of us are lazy saying that God has a plan for you to have a good marriage. It's time to go out and date. 
we are lazy and refuse to do the work needed. Faith without works is dead. And so till we begin to build a new culture in the kingdom where our steps and our works are motivated by faith, we are but lazy and will not receive the promises of God. If I'd stayed here in the United States, I would have sat on the prophetic word of people getting healed and delivered and no one will be healed and delivered. And it wouldn't mean that God did not want them healed and delivered. It was because I was lazy and I did not want to go. Every time you decide to sit down and do nothing, you are crippling the fulfillment of the word of God. I'll say it again. Every time you decide to sit down and do nothing, you are crippling the manifestation of the word of God. It's time for saints to have a mindset of seeing God's kingdom come. And it starts by us not being lazy. It says, do not be lazy, but imitators of them who through faith and patience receive the promises. It is important that believers begin to emphasize the quality of faith. It's not enough to say, I believe God. It's time for us to do works which match what we say we believe. If you say you believe that God heals the sick, my question is, when was the last time you prayed for the sick? If you believe that God has called you to be one who makes disciples, when was the last time you shared Christ with anyone? If the word is not mixed with faith, definite steps of faith, action motivated by faith, we will see very little. Is it not amazing that today there is so much darkness in the world because the light refused to shine? You are refusing to shine. I'm refusing to shine. We are refusing to take responsibility to bring God's kingdom. And we're sitting down and singing, Come Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. And we are waiting for the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, the kingdom of God, it does not come by observation. The kingdom of God is within you. When we became born again, the spirit of the kingdom came within us. Now, that Holy Spirit who is sitting in you and me is looking for bold men and women who will step out in faith and say, because of this, I believe, I will do this. When we refuse to align our works with our faith we frustrate the grace of god it's not the absence of god anointing us to bring change into the world it's the absence of people who do not want to be responsible if this church is going to become a great church and it's already a great church but it can be a greater church we need people to become responsible people who say i believe that this is a good church and invite people to come to church and follow up, to, up after them who will say, I believe it's such a great church, I want to sing in the choir. Oh, yes. Because faith without works is dead. It is important that we understand that without the agency of faith, we will see very little done in the earth. Jesus, speaking about faith, the Bible says that when the Son of Man comes back to the earth, will he find faith on the earth? And he was not speaking just about works, but was speaking about prayer. One of the first revelation of our lack of faith is the absence of prayer in our lives. When we begin to embrace prayer as part of the kingdom life, it's a, it's a direct revelation that we understand that by our own strength, we cannot prevail. I don't know about you, but even when I went there on missions, I, I fell sick to malaria. And I realized by my strength, I can do very little. But through the malaria, I was preaching the gospel. Oh yeah. Beloved, when we refuse to pray, we refuse to invite the greatest power in heaven and earth to intervene on our behalf. Many churches today do not pray. 
When I say many churches today do not pray, we think about prayer services. But I'm talking about many saints do not pray. They wake up in the morning and do not talk to God and therefore do not really have faith that God can intervene in your lives. Can I challenge someone in this church as part of the kingdom culture, it's time to build a quality life of prayer. In Matthew, in Mark chapter 1 verse 35, the Bible says, a great while before they give me Mark 135. It's not on my notes. I want to share something with you. Can I share something with you? Are you sure? Oh, we should close and go home. Okay, let's do it. In Mark 135, the Bible says, give it to me. A great while before day, Jesus rose up and went to a solitary place and there he prayed. So we see Jesus during the day, do, I'm waiting for the verse being projected. We see Jesus during the day, he's rotting signs, wonders, and miracles, preaching and doing different things. But we have a glimpse in Mark 1.35 and it says, a great while before day, Jesus would rise up and pray. Beloved, for us to bring the change necessary to be a light in this world, we need to recognize that we have to spend enough time with the Lord. You might say, Pastor Leo, you know I have a busy job. You can pray to God in the car on your way to work. Oh yeah. Because God is looking to give you the power of the Holy Spirit to bring his kingdom wherever you are. So he says, a great while before day, Jesus went away to a quiet place and there he prayed. Because he knew that throughout the day, he needs to pray for someone. He needs to preach the gospel. He needs to live life in honor of God. So for him to live life in accordance to the faith he believes, he literally decided to pray. When we pray, we tap into the power of the Holy Spirit necessary for the change that we need. We can pray early in the morning. Paul even puts it this way, pray without season. <laughs> we can pray all times of the day, but I encourage you pray early in the morning or right at night before you sleep and present your day to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your help. Come and help me. Amen. The next one. He says that for us to be able, Hebrews 6 verse 12. It says that for us to be able to inherit the promises of God, we need to be the followers of them, not just by faith. <laughs> you see, it's easy to say I have faith in God, so I'm praying. And I have faith in God, so I'm doing this. But the second part says that by patience, we will inherit the promises of God. As a son of the living God, there are things that God has ordained for your life. And it's just a matter of time. And so, he begins to speak to us about the word patience. We all know patience is uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so, the word used for patience, it's the word macrothumia, which actually is nicknamed for a long nose. So he says that for you to inherit what God has for you, it's like your mama preparing a good meal for you, right? And the meal is not yet ready. You could actually take it from the oven and eat the chicken with, with how it is when it's not cooked. But if you wait till the right time when mama would lay the table, you would have the right meal he has for you. The same way when God has a blessing for you, he has a promise for you, he has a prophetic word for you, there is a time for the fulfillment of that promise. And he says that one of the things you need to do is learn to build patience. Without patience, we will not inherit God's best for our lives. There are many of us who married the wrong people because you could not be patient. You took the wrong job because you could not be patient. You said, Lord, I'm just tired of being unemployed. And so you're now doing a job which is underpaying you. And every day you're disgruntled. Many Christians are unsatisfied because they did not add patience to their faith. To inherit the promises, you need patience. So he uses the word long nose. 
And it's so beautiful because it's speaking about breathing. So, they use long nose by saying that patience is like long suffering, a long nose. Because when you breathe in and out, it kind of calms you down. So to build patience, we learn to align ourselves with the timing of God. Every believer needs patience if he's going to inherit what God has for him. To show patience in spite of troubles, it's not easy. And Christians must develop patience. The Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 3, knowing that the working of your faith worketh patience. I believe that we need to understand that the culture of learning to wait on the Lord must return back to the church. We must learn to wait and wait back on the Lord. To wait on the Lord means to stay in one place or delay an action till a particular time. There is actually a time for everything under the sun. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says there's a time for every purpose under the sun. So, for example, as a young boy, you couldn't wait to drive, but there was an age, there was a time where you could get your license and drive legally. You could actually desire to vote, but till you get to a certain age, a certain appointed time, it's your right as an American, but till the appointed time, you cannot vote. Is the same with every Christian. Every Christian must accept that for every purpose of God, there is the right time, there is the right season. This message is one of the hardest messages to preach because we want miracles. I am a man who believes in miracles. I pray to God for miracles all the time with people. But the reality is that when we read our Bible, Jesus did not just do miracles. He also did healings. There were times where people were healed instantly, and there were times where they got healed later on. Believers must accept that without patience and learning to wait for God's timing and season, they will go ahead of God. Most of us have gone ahead of God. I know God has called you, but he is preparing you at the backside of the desert. Stay at the backside of the desert. Moses stayed for 40 years and God was preparing him. When God begins to prepare you, he is saying to you that there is a purpose ahead of you, but I'm allowing patience to do a good work in you. When God chose Joseph to be the next prime minister, the Bible says that the word of God tried Joseph. This morning, I'm here to tell someone the word of God has been trying you and it makes no sense. Psalm 105, verse 17 to 19. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, and he was sold as a slave. Look at his preparation. He dreams about God making him a great ruler. And part of the preparation is he has to be sold as a slave. And so the Lord said that part of God making him a great ruler is that he sent Joseph before them. But God, you didn't tell me that as part of becoming a great ruler, I have to be sold as a slave. You didn't tell me that it involves my brothers rejecting me. Listen to me. Some of you, people have rejected you and turned your backs on you. It was part of your preparation. It was part of God sending you ahead of them. But most of us are fighting and said, I need you back in my life. <laughs> the Bible said that he sent Joseph ahead of them and bound him in chains. Is it possible that for the church of Jesus Christ, there are things that God puts us through to prepare us for the season? He puts it this way, Paul. Oh, these afflictions are but for a moment, for an external glory which will be revealed. There is a glory about to be revealed, but there are some afflictions. There are preparations. There are processes God has to take you through. So he says, let's look at this. Let's, let's read the verse. It's beautiful. And he bound his feet in shackles. Imagine you had the dream God was going to make you president of the United States of America, but it didn't tell you that you were going to be, <laughs> there's a July 11 going to come. 
<laughs> they didn't tell you about that. They didn't tell you about the resistance. What would happen? Personally, in my life, I remember when I decided to get married. I had a dream of rain clouds destroying my wedding day. And the devil says, you know I'm going to resist you from getting married. And I said, bring it on. Because Christians must develop a tough skin and say, I am going to do what God has called me no matter what. It's time to build a tough skin and plow through. He never said that I will make a, will, I'll make a way for you in the open space. He says, I will make a way for you in the midst of a wilderness. God has said that in the midst of trials, temptations, hardships, Christians will come through. It's time to believe God for strength to go through. I'm sad to say this. Most of you were expecting God was going to deliver you from your shackles. He says you got to stay there a little bit more. Oh, yes. Because he's not done with you yet. You see, when Joseph was in prison, God was working on his heart so he could be the God kind of leader. He, he had the privilege of seeing how the Egyptians did it so he would not be an Egyptian kind of leader. There are things and situations you're in today, God is just driving foolishness from your heart. And you've got to allow him to do so. Allow God to use your current day situation to prepare you for tomorrow. Verse 19. Until the time where the word of prophecy, if it's your Bible, you can underline it because that is the highlight of today's message. Until the time where the word of prophecy or until the time when the word of prophecy concerning his brothers came true, the word of God tested him and refined him. There is a necessary testing and refinement needed for you to get to the other side. We want to go to the other side, but we are not interested in the storm. We want to experience the best God has for us, but we do. It's like saying you want to win a war without fighting general. No fighting, no winning of the war. Hallelujah. If you were to have victory, you need to fight. We need to contend and fight the good fight of faith so we can inherit God's best for us. So concerning Joseph, he says that the word of God tried him. You know, when I was coming this morning, I heard the word of the Lord and he said that tomorrow by this time, there will be an economic revival. And I said to God, why tomorrow and not today? He says, that's where your problem is. He says, my church is so impatient because they can't see the full picture. Imagine Jesus coming onto the scene without the John the Baptist. Some of us are running ahead of God without our John the Baptist. God wants to place people strategically in strategic locations so that we can fulfill our calling. And we're saying, God, you're going too slow. Why tomorrow? Do it today. We're saying, Jesus, you said you'll come soon, come now. Only if you knew that if Jesus came now, thousands will perish in hell. Out of his mercy, he's extended the time so that many more can come into the kingdom. So whenever you're frustrated, wondering why the word of God is delaying and you're walking righteously, sometimes know that God has set in his time. So it says, when the time came for the fulfillment of the prophetic word the word of God tried him and refined him some of you being a wife today will be the worst thing God ever did for you you can't even love yourself how are you going to love another man if today you became the manager for that company, you run that manager, that management down, that company down, because the word has not refined you. See, there's a refinement that takes place when we wait on the Lord, when we patiently wait on the Lord, because we come into a place of humility where we are like, God, I need your help. Only you can help me through this. Personally, in my life, there were times, let's look at Psalm 27 verse 14, there were times where as I waited for the Lord, I said to the Lord, I know you're a God, but I think that you can do this tomorrow. <laughs> I know you're a God, but I, I want to encourage you, speeding things up, Lord. Lord, I, I, I actually need a breakthrough. 
I was praying, I was fasting, I was doing everything. In Psalm 27 verse 14, the Bible says, what does it say? It says to us, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait again, I say, wait on the Lord. See, one of the things that happens when you decide to wait on the Lord patiently is that he strengthens your heart. I want you to project that verse. He says that wait on the Lord patiently and he will strengthen your hearts. You are looking for strength at the wrong places. That boyfriend is not going to give you strength. Oh, yes. That job is not going to give you strength. He says, wait on the Lord. As we wait on the Lord, he begins to release strength by the Holy Spirit to us. Moses is struggling to fulfill his ministry. He doesn't know how he's ever going to preach. And as he waits on the Lord, he receives the words of God and it strengthens him to stand before Pharaoh. And he says, now go forward and say, let my people go. When we take time to wait in his presence, there is a release of supernatural strength. I'm here to announce to you all nations, God is bringing a surge of strength to our heart as we decide to wait on him. This is not a common message in the church because we want everything to happen, boom. We want to make a church overnight. But God is calling all nations, it's time to wait on me. It's time to patiently wait for the promise that I have given you. Without learning the art of waiting on God, we will not see much accomplished in the earth. Jesus dies and overcomes hell on the grave, but for three days he has to wait. Have you ever thought about that? What's he still doing in the earth? What? He's already overcome Satan by the cross, but he has to wait for three days. Why? That it will be fulfilled. See, God had prophesied that like Jonah in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, the Son of Man, Jesus, would have to stay in the earth for three days. And Jesus is like, I'm ready. I've already overcome hell, death, and the grave. And God says, wait. So the Bible puts it this way. My God says to my Lord, sit down on my right hand till I make your enemies thy footstool. God says, I'm not done with birthing the new creation and destroying your enemies. So guess what? For three days, Jesus, you have to wait. Who are we thinking that we don't have to wait when Jesus had to wait? Till the fulfillment of the word of God, Jesus has to stay in the grave. Is it possible that God is keeping you in certain places till the fulfillment of the word of God? There are promises that he has spoken, and it's going to be fulfilled in his time. And we must learn to wait on the Lord. Because when we wait on him, there is a release of strength which comes to you and me. Psalm 40 verse 1. I waited patiently on the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Believers must recognize that when we begin to wait on the Lord, there are things that we can do. So I want to share few things you can do, just four things and we close. Four things you can do as you wait on the Lord's promises to be fulfilled in your life. Are there some promises you're believing for? Someone show me by hand. Is there something you're believing God for? There's a hope, there's a scripture, there's a prophetic word, there's something you believe God has for you. These are the four things you need to do as you wait patiently for God to fulfill his word. The first one, let's look at it. The first thing, and I run through very fast, settle in your heart that that promise is for you. You know, it's very easy to believe that God wants to heal people, but sometimes when we are sick, we wonder, is it God's will for me to be sick? Settle in your heart that healing is for you. Settle in your heart that that word you're hearing is for you. My God shall supply all my needs is for you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As you wait patiently, you must begin to count on God's faithfulness and settle that that promise, that prophetic word is for you. The second one, learn about what the Bible says concerning that subject as I wrap up. See, everything you hear, there are scriptures that back that thing. So whilst you wait on God fulfilling it, you need to start studying your Bible and finding scriptures that align with the fulfillment of that thing. 
Amen. Most Christians say that they believe in God for one breakthrough or another, but if I was to ask, give me two Bible verses that support that, you don't know. It's time for us to become diligent students of the word as we wait for the fulfillment of God's word. The third one, we need to live a life in anticipation of God's faithfulness, knowing that has he not said it and will he not do it? So you are waiting on the Lord, but you have your heart full of anticipation and expectation. You are not waiting, wondering, will he do it, will he not do it? But you know that God will do it any day now. Anticipation and expectation. The next one, we wait in prayer and planning. Most Christians don't like to plan. One of the things you can do as you wait on the Lord is ask God. The Bible said, by wisdom a house is built. So you are praying and saying, okay, God, what is the strategy for me to do what you are going to do? You need to find out if God wants you to be a family man. What is God's plan about raising a family? So you are praying and planning and you are talking to God and receiving wisdom to be able to fulfill that which is being given. So you pray and plan as you wait on the Lord. You pray and plan. And finally, you declare the promises of God are coming to pass. The Bible says, the Lord says that anything that we believe in our heart, according to his name, if we would speak and declare it, we'll have it. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Whilst we wait patiently and we've received faith in our heart, the Bible says that we must begin to declare, decree a thing and see it be established. All nations, I'm here to tell you, we are entered a new season where we'll begin to pray. We'll begin to decree a thing, decree your healing, decree your breakthrough, and see it come to pass. God's plan has never changed. He is faithful, and he wants you to inherit the earth. Let's stand to our feet and pray. This morning, I shared a very short message. And the message is God does not just want to tell you about what he wants to do. He wants you to partner with him in faith and patience to see the promises. I want you to just pray to God and thank him. Thank him for filling your heart with the faith necessary to see the inheritance you're looking for. Has he not said it? Will he not do it? Has he not said it? Will he not do it? Has he not said it? Will he not do it? Oh, yes. He will do it if you believe. If you believe. He is the miracle worker, the promise keeper. We want to declare that the Lord is going to be our miracle worker this season. He's going to be our promise keeper for he is here. Lift up your hands as we begin to declare it in worship. You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? Then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 1030 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.